Okay, and share. I can't really and hear it very well. Yeah, and I want to welcome Luis to the, let's see, where are we? Ah, oh, what happened to him? Okay. I'm trying to get back my full thing, you know, and I don't know what happened to it. Yeah. Oh, okay. Okay, I know exactly what happened. All right, screen share. Okay. All right. So I want to welcome Louis Katz, who is a fantastic black and white photographer out of Baltimore. Uh, I don't really know much more. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, good, good, good. I don't really know much else about you, uh, Luis, you know, so you got to fill in the gaps. I will, I'll be glad to introduce myself. Okay, so go ahead and, and, and do it. Okay, so first I'm going to ask everybody to mute their microphones so that we don't get any um, feedback noise. Okay. And you should also take your video down. Okay. Yeah, I think so. Am I muted? No, you're not. Okay, uh, sorry. Um, so that we have the best wavelength. We don't have a large group, but even so, occasionally, it's better to have everyone's video and, and audio off. Um, yes, my name is Lewis Katz. I'm a member of the Baltimore Camera Club. Uh, I live in Baltimore City. I've been living in Baltimore City for a little over 20 years. And I've been, I, be I belong to the Baltimore Camera Club for the same length of time. And um, I started out as a photographer when I was a teenager. Uh, my dad was, a, was the photographer of the family. He always shot slides of all of our family vacations. And um, I think I picked up the bug from him. And I was lucky enough to go to a New York City high school that offered photography as an elective. So I was able to take a couple of courses in photography and um, set up a dark room in my basement. And so that's how my career started. Uh, my career career actually was in the travel business. So for 40 years, I was a variety of different things in the travel business, which gave me another great opportunity to shoot. So until I joined the camera club, I would have described myself as a uh, Fuji slide travel nature landscape photographer. That's how, if you would have asked me, that's what I, how I would have described myself. And Upon joining the camera club, when I formally moved to Baltimore, I became much more influenced by the people that I now call my friends and my, my photo comrades. Uh, and that's where I began to develop my love of black and white photography, which is what we're gonna talk about tonight. So at this point, I'm gonna just share my screen, which hopefully will work. I think we can see your screen right now. Not you will in a second. You should now see my Lightroom screen. Can someone just verify that? Okay, yeah. yeah okay. Capture the screen, yeah. Yep, all right. So now I'm gonna just minimize everybody and take down this panel. Come on. Well, I'm going to bring it up later. But I'm going to take it. Okay, so the, the formal name of the program is from Capture to Print, The Art of Black and White Photography. I was lucky enough when I went out to set up a website uh, years ago, my name was still available. So I was able to just get lewiscatsphotography.com. And that email address of Olympus21209 at Yahoo is my photo email address. So it's separated out from all of our other stuff that we do. And so if anyone has any relate questions or things that we don't cover tonight, uh, that would be the email address that you would reach me at. 
I've also given Laszlo two um, documents. Well, not two, do two, two, two things that he's going to distribute to you. One is sort of a recap document that recaps what we're going to talk about tonight. And the second is a link to a survey monkey survey. I'm very big on surveys. I'm used to teaching in front of the classroom at Johns Hopkins. And when I started doing Zoom classes and Zoom presentations, you know, getting feedback is not immediate. So getting these surveys back, which is totally anonymous, I'll know they, they came from your club, but I won't know who, um, is a great way for me to get feedback. And I've actually used the answers and the, the comment section, especially to make changes to certain of my presentations. So if please just take a couple of minutes and, and fill it out and, and send it back, that, uh, that would be greatly appreciated. So what we're gonna talk about tonight, you're gonna hear me talk about emotions much more than you're gonna hear about me talking about technical lingo in terms of photography. Ansel Adams, one of my favorite Ansel quotes is this one, a great photograph is one that truly expresses what one feels in the deepest sense about what is being photographed. And I think what Ansel is saying here is that you as the photographer need to have a strong emotional connection with your subject matter. And the stronger that connection is, the better quality imagery you will create because by having a strong emotional connection, you're invested. It's not like just shooting snapshots. It's, it's something that you feel deeply about. And that doesn't mean every single element that you decide to shoot, but in general, you should identify, and this takes time and thought, the, the things or the people or the, the, the specific items that are really important to you that you should spend your time photographing. And what we're going to start with is a very brief overview of some people that have influenced my black and white photography. And of course, why not start with an Ansel Adams iconic image of the Tetons and the Snake River. And you know, Ansel didn't have very many people or animals in his shots, but you felt the visceral connection that Ansel Adams had with the environment. And he was a very early ardent environmentalist. He was already worried about what we were doing to our planet back in the 1950s and 1960s. And I think when you look at his iconic images and not every image by Ansel is iconic, you really get that feel of how strongly he felt about the environment. Another photographer that's influenced me, we didn't even know about until she passed away and her auctions were, her negatives were auctioned off and that's Vivian Mayer. And if anyone doesn't know about her story, you should read up about Vivian Mayer who was a nanny by profession, but always had a camera. And to me, a great black and white photograph combines a wonderful graphic context, which in this case is that beautiful vanishing wall on the right. I think this is right next to Central Park and the benches on the left and the beautiful shadows and silhouettes in the puddle. And of course, then you have the dad and the two young kids and the kids are on roller skates and the young girl turns around and pop Vivian gets the shot. And if you're not familiar with her photography, you, you should become familiar with it because she actually in retrospect was probably one of our better black and white street um, photographers. It's hard to do a presentation without mentioning Cartier-Bresson um, he, of course, is known for the decisive moment, but I think that's really not the right way to think about Cartier-Bresson. This, again, is that combination of a beautiful graphic context, the wet pavement, the stairs going up on the left, the implied stairway that's in front of the gentleman with the cane. But by far, it's the cat that makes this picture. And it, the cat makes the picture because cats bring atmosphere and mystery to imagery. Um, and Bresson used cats quite a lot in his imagery. And I am a cat person more than a dog person. 
and there's something about cats. There's, there's, you know, they're mysterious. They're, they're, there's an atmosphere. There's a poise about cats that many other animals don't have. And I think it's the cat that really makes this picture so great. I also love Margaret Bork White. This image would be astounding even without the people because of the repetition, the tonality, it's got all the elements of a great black and white photo, but it, in addition to the great elements, it's got people. And the people make you wonder about how many days a week do they do this job? How many hours per day are, there, are, there, are they on their feet? And to me, those are the great photographs, the ones that make you think and make you wonder rather than just showing you something. Dorothea Lang, definitely another one of my favorites. She wants you just to look at the young girl staring into the empty fireplace. What is she thinking? Are we gonna have wood for a fire tonight? Are we gonna have food to eat today? So again, whatever the colors of that humble abode are, they would definitely distract you from what she wants you to look at. And what she wants you to look at is the beautiful light streaming in through the window and the girl's face in the shadow with this very pensive expression. Again, an image that makes you think, that makes you wonder. Again, this is by a guy that never really became very famous, Leonard Farkas. But when I saw this image, I had to include it because again, it combines a wonderful graphic context of those buildings and those shapes and those sconces, but it's those two cats that make this picture. The cat approaching is very friendly in posture, tail up, ears up, and the, and the cat in the foreground is completely the opposite, tense, anxious, and the beauty of this image is we just don't know what happened when these two animals actually came in contact with each other. And that creates the tension and that creates the atmosphere. And I think those qualities resonate far more greatly in black and white than they do in color. Robert Frank, who was very well known for his book called The Americans, went out to just document America. I had just someone told me from another presentation that it has just recently been re-released because for many years it was unavailable. And what Robert Frank wants you to look at is these people that are beautifully framed by the window frames and the diversity of age and the diversity of ethnicity that exists in America. And the reflections on the window panes above are also a really nice addition. And again, you know, that streetcar could be dark green, it could be red, it could be brown, but whatever the color would be, it would distract you from what he wants you to look at. And what he wants you to look at are the people in the window frames. A uh, very famous Chinese photographer, Fan Ho, took advantage of a really critical aspect of photography, and that's your vantage point, where you literally are when you create the image. And he has found himself a great vantage point looking straight down at these beautiful columns of light. And another great quality of a photographer is patience, because I don't believe when he took his first look down that he saw a person in each one of these columns of light casting those beautiful shadows. And shadows are such a big part of black and white photography. I think he had to wait until the right moment and then he caught the right moment. And it's again, one of those images that just makes you think these seven people are completely unconnected. They have no relationship to each other. And you're just left to wonder you know, where are they off to? What are they doing? What are they thinking about? And I just love imagery that does that. Without, with me leaving out the impact of black and white movies on my black and white photography would be a real mistake because I find the movies, especially by Hitchcock and by Orson Welles to be beautiful black and white creations. And I actually found a website 
that's called a thousand frames or a thousand, yeah, a thousand frames of Hitchcock, where a group of people took every one of his movies and distilled them down to a thousand still photographs. And this is from the film Notorious with Cary Grant in all of his suaveness sitting in a train car with that beautiful light striking him and the stripes going across his suit. So black and white movies have had a very definite influence on how I look at the world, you know, photographically in, in black and white. Here's another shot. This is from Strangers on a Train. And you know that Hitchcock told the cinematographer, get really low down because I want to get the full sweep of the rails and I want to get the trains. I want to get the buildings in the shot. And he was just a genius at creating really, you know, uh, what was hundreds of thousands of still photographs that he turned into a movie. Um, so it's really interesting when you start thinking about black and white movies as really a combination of thousands of still black and white photographs. Here's another one uh, from, Hitch, from a Hitchcock film. And just look how well balanced this image is. This guy with the cart is balanced by these two gentlemen right here. The louvers of the roof are really framing this image. I love the seven up sign. I love the diner sign in the background. You know, these weren't just haphazardly shot by the cinematographer. These were carefully constructed images, you know, by a master uh, filmmaker. Now, here's an interesting chart that turned my life around in terms of thinking about black and white and color photography because we naturally associate those emotions that are listed with those colors. We're not taught that. It's not something that our parents taught us. It's just something that we innately feel. And the reason why I love this chart is because it included the black, gray, and white. And just think of that image of Cary Grant sophistication from the black, authority from the gray, and coolness from the white. You know, it's kind of easy to see why those emotions are easy to express in black, white, and grayscale. Whereas if I told you I'd like you to make a series of melancholy images and I want them to all be yellow, you'd really have trouble with that because yellow is so inflective of joy and warmth and the sun. So this is an interesting chart to keep in mind when you're out in the field, because what I was told by the speakers that came through the camera club was that removing the color removes the distraction and that leaves the bones of the image. That is absolutely true. They just didn't take it one further step. And that one further step is that color can actually get in the way of what you're trying to say in the image. Now, the, an interesting example are cemeteries. That's where we bury our dead, and yet they're always filled with green grass, which, and we, we, we refer green to nature and to life. And so it's an interesting contrast that cemeteries are the way that they are because they just, the two things don't really jive with each other. So when I discovered this chart and started thinking about how I think about color and emotions, it really had a tremendous influence on me and my black and white photography. So this is just something to keep in mind as we go through this, uh, presentation tonight. So I'm going to show you some of my images first as color and then what my thought process was and the conversion to black and white, not the actual conversion, but the converted version. This is the Amtrak station in Baltimore. This is pre-COVID. And I used to shoot at the Amtrak station a lot, maybe three or four times a year. 
because I found that things happened at Amtrak stations and at airports that were emotionally fraught. You know, people were parting or they were reuniting. Or in the case of this shot, I sat on a bench across and just saw this young boy leaning on his um, suitcase. And I got such a wealth of emotion. You know, it was a combination of loneliness, boredom, escape, abandonment, but the colors were not helping me relate that feeling to you as the viewer. And by converting to black and white, I'm drawing your attention right to where I wanted to be drawn, to the, to the young boy. And I definitely wanted to keep the doors in because the doors represent what's going to happen, right? Someone is either going to come through those doors to greet this boy, or this boy is going to walk through those doors to get onto a train. And I love the window and the reflection onto the floor. We have these beautiful old buildings in Baltimore. This happens to be a library associated with a school and it has this gorgeous wrought iron staircase. Now there's an elevator that's been in this building for years. And so very few people ever use the spiral staircase to walk down the stairs. But one day I was there and I got lucky. I was framing this shot up and I heard footsteps and I said, oh, maybe this is my opportunity to get a person in this picture. And sure enough, a woman came down the stairs and she happened to be close enough to the railing that I was able to get her in the image. I used a slower shutter speed to bring a little motion into her. And to me, the emotion that I was getting was that she was like caught in a maelstrom, like in a vortex. But that dark green of the wrought iron was really drawing my eye away from what I wanted you and myself to see. And by doing a conversion, I'm drawing your eye much more to her as the subject of the picture. And again, this is a good example of just removing color, not because of the emotion, but because of how overwhelming it was in terms of um, the image. Here's the Amtrak station again, where I come across this gentleman taking a nap on the bench. Is he homeless? Does he work for one of the cleaning services? Did he just stop by to use the services, the public services, which are open? And I, I love the shot, but the color casts were really poor, especially that green color cast in the background. I love all of the architectural details, the sconces on the wall. I even like the telephones and the Amtrak police sign. But as a color file, it wasn't transmitting what I wanted you as the viewer to think about and to feel. And by converting it, I was able to keep everything in that I wanted in and now the lines on the bench really just become leading lines that lead you right to the, the gentleman. And I was able to punch up his reflection a little bit that you can see in the bench. So again, it, this was an example of removing the distractions, but also removing a mixture of emotion that I didn't want you as the viewer to feel. I just want you to wonder what's going on with this gentleman. Because again, I love creating imagery that makes you think. Now, sometimes you get lucky. I was at the Museum of Modern Art and I was crossing from one gallery to the other and I turned to my left and I saw this. Now, what this is in the literal sense is two water fountains, but I immediately saw a potentially abstract black and white photograph. Uh, because I saw those shadows as skirts and I saw those reflections coming up from the basins as some sort of like energy fields. And so by converting it and darkening down the skirts and brightening up the reflective ability of those basins, I was able to, I think, successfully create an abstract photo. And to me, an abstract is when you take something 
that looks one way in the literal world that you turn into something that may look like something else in the abstract world. And if you're going to concentrate on abstract photography, which is a difficult style of photography, stick with black and white because the colors will really get in your way of the shapes and the formations that you're trying to create. So I always liked this image and I thought it was successful. Now, a question I get a lot, and we will stop once for questions during the presentation, and then we'll stop, of course, at, at the end. Two questions I get all the time, do I shoot in black and white, and do I think in black and white? The answer to the first one is no, I never shoot in black and white. Unless you own a Leica monochrome camera, which is built just to take black and white photos, you should absolutely always shoot in color and convert later because the algorithms in your camera that convert images from color to black and white are not nearly as powerful as the algorithms in Lightroom or as in Nick Silver FX Pro. Now, do I think in black and white? Absolutely. When I looked at this image, I didn't like the color file at all but I saw the potential of creating a black and white image from this file. And from this file came this. And by converting it, I was able to darken down the skies, brighten up that house, which is nothing far from an abandoned home. That's actually a beautiful mansion. And I was able to bring out some of the details in the trees and it was very important for me to keep those power poles off to the left because it gives the image a lot of scale. So I don't shoot in black and white, but there are many times when I'm already thinking, ooh, this is going to look really nice as a black and white you know, image. And I think this one came out really successfully. I'm on a schooner. I'm with my wife on vacation. We're up in Maine. We're on you know, the bay and there's a lot of schooners. And the first half hour of the trip, I spent my time trying to shoot moving schooners from a moving schooner. Not an easy task. I panned some, which came out kind of interesting, but I still wasn't happy with those. And then of course I turned around and I said, well, why am I wasting my time? I've got this great captain. He called himself Captain Jack that I can concentrate on creating a great environmental portrait, which is why that rope is included, because you know that he's manning a boat. And this was the color file, but I was able to make it again far more dramatic by converting it to black and white. Um, the beard, his glasses, his straw hat, uh, I was able to make the clouds a little stormier. So again, I spent the last hour of the cruise either just enjoying myself and watching the scenery or shooting pictures of Captain Jack. It was far more successful than shooting pictures of the other schooners. Uh, my wife and I are big Art Deco fans. I grew up in New York City. The Chrysler building is one of my favorite buildings in the world. And we finally got the opportunity two years ago before COVID. We were in Manhattan. We were told about a certain rooftop bar that had a good view of the Chrysler building. We made it to the rooftop bar. I finagled my tripod center post so it would be above the security fence so people wouldn't fall off the roof, you know, because of drinking. And I was able to get this shot of the Chrysler building. And I liked the fact that it was framed by those two office towers. But again, here's another example where the colors, not only are they distracting, but the yellow tones on that building on the left, which is actually completed, the building on the right is still under construction, bring in warmth and different feelings that really I didn't want to be part of the picture. And so by converting it to black and white and by cropping it to a, a way so that you can see more of the building of the right than the one on the left, I was able to create an image that I was really happy with because I believe your eye is definitely first drawn to the Chrysler building. 
then you start to look at the details in the, especially in the unfinished building because every one of those floors has a lot of cool detail and I was able to use a slower shutter speed because I was on a tripod and that's what gave me some movement in the clouds. So this was uh, my homage to uh, the Chrysler building. Now, when COVID hit, I know we all kind of panicked because it was like, what are we gonna do for photography? People's workshops got canceled, travel plans got canceled. We knew we could move around, but it was gonna be local for the most part. And one of the first things I thought of was, you know, I hadn't shot any macro photography in ages. And I used to love macro photography. And I went out and I bought myself a nice set of calla lilies and set up a home studio using natural window light and began to work on shooting macros. Now, when I looked at this image through the viewfinder, calla lilies to me are the most elegant and sophisticated flower. Um, and yet that green tone, think about that chart that I showed, it just wasn't translating what I wanted the calla lily to translate. And by converting it, it immediately took on the qualities that you can, that you can remember from that chart. Elegance, sophistication, coolness. And right away, I knew the rest of the project, although I was gonna shoot them in color, they were all gonna get converted to black and white. So that, this is one, here's another one. At first, I was trying to get as much in focus as possible. I don't think I focus stacked, but I was using high apertures to try and get as much in focus. But as I created the in focus ones, I started to think, you know, these would make very cool abstract black and whites. And so that's what led to ones like this. This is the exact same shot as the first flower, but with me using very low aperture settings and painting in the background using my adjustment brushes. The black background that you saw at first is my blank TV screen, um, which makes for a great black background. But as I started to play with the abstracts, I really began to have more fun with those because you can create whatever you want to create when you delve into the field of abstract you know photography here i am just you know focused on the what i call the veins i know that's not the right term and that is throwing the edge of the calla lily completely out of focus and i just love the look and at the same time i started working on some darker series um, some of these were outside, some of these were inside. I was also going through a bit of a health crisis at the moment, at the time I took these. And I showed them to a friend of mine who said to me, you know, Lewis, these are very different images than you normally shoot. And I wonder if it's because of what you're going through health-wise that you're actually bringing to the camera, which is why your imagery looks so different from what it normally looks like. And, you know, I hadn't thought that thought, but I think my friend Arthur was right because you do bring everything that your life has been made up to, to that date when you look through your viewfinder because you are expressing yourself through your photographs. So here's just a series of darker, you know, images. This one is nice because it's, you know, life. It's a very young fern growing in my garden, but I darkened down the background. Here's another one where I darkened down each leaf individually, but I left the two cornflowers at the top very bright white. Um, and this is all really cool use of, of black and white, you know, photography. Now, another great quality that I mentioned before that we need is patience. And here's an example of me finding the backdrop, but not having the person. I loved the backdrop. The graphic context is wonderful. The fences, the light poles, the trees, that's an abandoned power plant that's sitting on an island in the East River. 
But what I needed was a person to make this picture complete. And you can see the stairs coming up from the left. And I just knew with a little patience, someone would come up those stairs. And sure enough, within about five or 10 minutes, this gentleman who was happened to be wearing all dark clothing, which was great, came up those stairs and walked toward me. And I just started shooting him a few steps behind where he is now and a few steps ahead. And I just picked the one that I liked the best. But to me, this picture lacked a feeling of vulnerability and, a pic and, 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 and an emotional aspect to it. So these are just some you know, ones that I already converted. This is again at the Amtrak station, but on this particular day, I went with a project in mind. And I think that's another great thing that photographers should do, either just for a day or a week or a month or several years. I went this day only thinking about shadows and silhouettes. That's all I was gonna concentrate on that day. And I found myself on a bench sitting across from that beautiful column of light that's coming from the door opposite. And I just watched the people as they came through the column of light. And this was, as Bresson would say, the decisive moment. I got this, this was the greatest shot because her foot's in the air. She's wearing a really nice fancy pair of boots. Her reflection is in the, the shadow. Uh, you don't see any part of her which adds to the mystery and the atmosphere. So you don't really know, you know, where she's going, what she's doing. You know, it could be part of a spy picture or it could be just a very normal business trip. But it leaves that up to your imagination, which I love to do with, with, with imagery. Just a couple of weeks ago, Sunday morning, it began as a rainy day, and I looked outside at three o'clock in the afternoon, and a fog had rolled into my neighborhood in Baltimore. And as soon as you see fog as a photographer, if you're able to, you grab your camera and you run, because fog is just a great, great weather element for black and white photography. And I knew that in my neighborhood, there were some stands of trees that were unencumbered by houses or cars. And I couldn't get the whole vertical sweep of the, of the trees. And so I just took this as a horizontal, sort of giving you a, a truncated version. But by doing this as a horizontal, I was able to concentrate on these trees that had the ivy growing on them and I was able to look closely at ones where the tonality differed from tree to tree and you can see how thick the fog is in the background because you should be able to see a lot more trees back there. So I was happy with this because it was really you know I ran out and five minutes later I was standing in front of this this stand of trees but it really wasn't what I was trying to get you know from this fog and on my way home I pass a park and I took a look to my left and then I saw what I really wanted which was an image that looked much more like this which were these two trees one standing in front of the other one is really apparent and one is being lost in the fog. And you can see all the things that are being lost in the fog in the background. Um, and this was the kind of image that I was hoping to grab because it was also getting dark out. And so I had a very limited amount of time to create an image like this, but fog and rain and snow and mist, they are your black and white, photography friends. That's how you should look at them. So here's an interesting little experiment that I just did. I went out the other day, actually, and I was looking for sycamore trees. And sycamore trees are the ones that are white, have white bark in the winter. And what I wanted to do was compare Lightroom's conversion techniques to Nick's conversion techniques. And so I'm going to show you three images of the same image in a row. All three of them are HDRs that were created by combining three images. This is the Lightroom black and white 
HDR version, meaning that I converted the images from color to black and white, and then I merged them into an HDR file. And to me, it's a little too messy. There's too much apparent um, stuff that you can still see in the background, and the sycamore isn't really standing out enough. So then I tried Lightroom another way, and it dulled down the background a little bit, and I liked it more. And then the third version was the Nick version, which I decided I liked the best. Now, the problem with Nick is they just did an upgrade recently from Nick Silver Effects 2 to Nick Silver Effects 3. And I'm having nothing but problems with 3. Uh, it's really, I may even go back to 2 if there's a way to do that, because 3 has a lot of bugs. It's really slow in its um, response time. So I'm not, I love Nick and I love Nick Silver Effects, but I like Nick Silver Effects 2 a lot more than their more updated version, which of course I had to pay, you know, $59 to get to upgrade, which is a shame. So that's just, just an interesting example of how different um, conversions look. Now, I love trees. I think most photographers love shooting trees. I've shot this tree for over 15 years. I know exactly where it is. Before I lived in Baltimore, I lived north of town in the country in Southern York County, Pennsylvania. And I consider this tree to be a good friend of mine. Um, when I visit this tree, it's like visiting an old friend. And I know one day I'm gonna go back and it'll, it'll be gone. It'll be blown down in a storm or a farmer will buy the development and build townhomes. But while I still can, I still try and get up to where this tree is at least two or three times a year um, to shoot it. I don't like it nearly as much when it leaves out. I don't, that's in general, my attitude toward trees. I like them when they're bare, but I'm also gonna throw in the fact that when you find an area that you like to shoot in, you should revisit that area as often as you can because that's what helps you create that emotional connection to your subject matter. So this was just a really nice image of this particular tree on a day that it had just finished snowing a little bit and I still had that nice stormy sky behind the, uh, behind the tree. Snow is a wonderful graphic way to shoot black and white. As soon as we have some weather, I'm and I don't feel like shooting in an urban environment. I drive right back up to the country where I used to live. It's only a half hour, 40 minute drive. And these are just fences in the snow, but they make a beautiful graphic black and white image, especially those two fences crossing in the middle. Um, so it's got a definite foreground, middle ground and, and, and background. Same farm, different side. This is the side where they have the horses. And when I first composed this image, this horse on the left wasn't in the image. The image sort of ended right there. And it was very unbalanced because there were too many horses on the right with nothing to balance them out. And again, patience is what was required. I knew, because there were horses over here, I knew that if I just waited a few minutes, one or two would certainly walk over. And within five minutes, one walked over, stuck his nose in the snow, found some grass to eat, picked his head up, pop goes the shutter, I get the shot. And this horse is so important to the rest of the composition because he balances out the composition, which is important whether it's black or white or color. This is, was a muddy brown side of a barn with a white door. The muddy brown was definitely not attractive, but I knew that I, if when I converted it, I could turn it into a variety of charcoal grays, which is exactly what I did. And I love the fact that the latch on this door is open, which just, again, those little details sometimes are really important in, you know, in a photograph. 
but black and white is great for this kind of stuff. Just real graphic, you know, photography. This was also taken late this fall. We got about a three inch snowfall. I went out into rural Maryland and after it snowed, we then got some ice. That's what's covering all those trees in the back is the ice. Um, and I'm just using these fallow corn rows to just draw your eye right into the farm scene. And notice that although this is a grain silo, I waited for a gust of wind to come along and it blew the snow off the top, which gives the impression that it's more like a smokestack than a grain silo. So again, patience. I knew there had to be snow on top of that silo and I just had to wait for a strong enough gust of wind to come to pick it up and blow it, um, which is what it did. This image was taken the same day. Um, and notice, by the way, that I do a lot of vertical format because vertical format allows you to include so many more levels or fields of interest of in, in, uh, in a photograph. In this image, you have like six distinct different fields. And when I say fields, I don't mean literal fields like this. What I mean is this one right here is field number one. These trees here are field number two. The house is field number three. The snow in the background is field number four. The trees in the background are field number five. And the clouds and the snow and the storm are field number six. You would not be able to accomplish that with a horizontal format. You just could not get in that much detail in a scene. And this was taken no more than a half a mile from where I used to live, um, right outside of Shrewsbury, uh, Pennsylvania. Um, so um, always remember to turn your camera the other way before you decide on what composition is going to work the best. All right, so before we dive into this, this is, our, this is where I usually take uh, a stop. So if you have any questions or comments, you can just press your space bar, which will unmute your microphone. So if anyone has any questions or comments that they want to make at, at this time, please uh, feel free. And we will do this again at the end. Oh, no questions, no comments. Okay. I have I have one question. Can you hear me? Yep, absolutely. Um, I'm I'm not sure if I missed this or not, but did you um indicate which uh program you primarily use to process your photos? I think you mentioned uh neck effects or silver silver effects. So, Is that the primary one or Lightroom well, or which one? Okay, so here's the here's the story on that. I was primarily until maybe three or four months ago, no, until about six or seven months ago, a Lightroom user. I don't even use Photoshop. I have it, but I don't even know how to use Photoshop. So I was mostly a Lightroom guy. When I discovered Nick Silver Effects Pro, I became more, I, I started using that more often. But what they just did was screw me over and screw a lot of other photographers over because this upgrade to Nick Silver Effects 3 is not a good upgrade. And if you have two, just stick with it because three has a lot of bugs that DxO is aware of. They're working on trying to fix them. And as I said, I may even try and downgrade back to two because of all the issues that I'm having with three. Most of the images that you're seeing tonight were converted in Lightroom. And we're gonna do some, we're gonna do some actual conversions in Lightroom as part of the program. Okay, yeah, I was wondering how much um, post-processing you actually do on your photos. Um, a fair amount, but it depends on the image. You know, some images need more, some images need less, and some images, it depends on what you're trying to say with the image. So, you know, um, you know, when I get to the post-processing part of the, of the um, 
program, which is coming up right away, uh, you'll hear me make some more comments about post-processing. Okay. Yeah, black and white photography and the processing is something that I've tried and just haven't been able to master. So I have okay. about three good black and white photos and that's about it. So I was okay. curious. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Sure. Anybody, any other questions before we move on? Okay. Well, then this, of course, um, is the zone system that was developed by Ansel Adams and a guy named Fred Archer, but Fred Archer always seems to get his name left off. And I'm only showing you this because Ansel felt that in his prints, especially, he really needed something that was pure black and something that was pure white and everything else sort of fell in between. But that's not really why I'm showing you this chart. I'm showing you this chart because it relates in a way to this chart. And this for black and white photography is much more important. And it was eye-opening to me because this chart shows how these those six colors actually reflect in grayscale. And what really surprised me was that this hot pink actually came out with a brighter tonality or luminosity, those are but interchangeable terms, than yellow did. And what also surprised me was that dark blue came out as dark as it did. And so for example, you cannot assume, like here's a really nice shot of some row homes of Baltimore. And when I took this image, I thought to myself, wow. And I hadn't seen that chart yet. I was already thinking that this was gonna really turn into a nice black and white. I had some nice colors. I had a blue sky. So I had a lot of things that I could play with, but if you watch, if I just do a straight conversion, it actually comes out extraordinarily flat. And that's because the luminosity of those colors are actually very similar to each other. And now I could punch up each one of those individual colors, but my point is just to show you, and I have one more example, that you just can't assume like here's these beautiful um, petunias that I took on my back patio. You cannot automatically assume that because you have a lot of color in front of you that it's gonna convert to a great black and white. Now, for instance, look how flat this one looks as a black and white. There's no hardly any contrast at all. And that's because the luminosity values of those different colors must be very similar to each other. And again, you could punch up each one of those individual colors to make it more contrasty, but I'm just showing you this as, an ex as examples that not necessarily do colorful things create good black and white imagery. That's, that was really my point in showing you these two, those two files. Okay, so now we'll start talking about um, con conversions and post-processing. So my first comment about post-processing is it should be a means to an end. And what do I mean by that? I mean that in my early days of digital photography and having Lightroom, I would take an image that I wasn't really sold on but I would fool myself into thinking that if I took it into Lightroom and I played with all the sliders, I could create something wonderful. That is just not the way it works. That's never going to work. You first have to have the bones of a really good image that may look better as a black and white, and then you have to decide, well, what's my goalpost? What's going to make it look better as a black and white? That's going to increase the speed of your workflow um, tremendously. So when I say means to an end, what I mean is you first have to like the picture yourself. It has to speak to you in some way. Then you have to consider, well, would this look better as a black and white or should I keep it as a color file? 
Now, I live pretty close to Lancaster County, which is a very big home base of the Amish. Now, the Amish are famous for not wanting their pictures taken, which is actually due to a biblical quotation. It doesn't have anything to do with the American Indian reason for not wanting their picture taken. But there are events that happen at this time of year, actually, and they are happening this year, called mud sales, where the Amish community is raising money for the volunteer fire company by having a sale in a field, and it's usually called a mud sale because by this time of year, the fields are very muddy and they're auctioning off everything from buggies to quilts, to livestock, to, um, you know, you name it, it's being auctioned off. And I, at these events, I feel that because they're, the public is invited I don't feel at all apprehensive about shooting pictures of Amish folks. I don't use a short lens. I I don't shoot Gary Winogrand style by getting right in their face. I'm usually using something like a 70 to 140. Um, And what I'm doing is scanning the crowd and I'm looking for interesting people and interesting faces to shoot. And I usually concentrate on the adolescent age group between like eight, nine and 15 years old because I find those to be more interesting images. And what I try and do, a question I get a lot is, well, do you ask permission? And the answer to that is no, I never ask anyone permission to take their picture because the moment you ask permission, you've lost the moment of candidness. But what I do try and do is make eye contact with the person that I'm taking their picture of, because that creates a moment in time where you two are connecting, where the photographer and the person makes a brief connection. And so here was a a young boy, I would say he's probably about 14. I liked his face, I loved his hat. But one of the qualities of black and white is timelessness and color completely takes away that feeling of timelessness. And by converting it simply to black and white, it immediately brings back that feeling that this image could have been taken in the 30s or the 40s or the 50s. Whereas the color version, you get the feeling right away that it was taken kind of recently. Um, And that's one of the other qualities of black and white that I love is that it's timeless. And in terms of other darkroom or digital darkroom work that I had to do on this image, you can see that I brought up the shadows and I brought up the whites because I wanted to bring out more detail in his, in his face. Um, and that's how I created this image. And other examples of this style of photography, his, here's a young Amish girl and her scarf was bright pink. And that just didn't work, you know, to create a timeless quality. The bright pink was far too modern a color. And here's another gentleman that I took a picture of. He's obviously not really happy that I'm taking his picture. Uh, You can tell from the expression on his face, but we made eye contact and that's what was important to me. And again, converting it to black and white just gave it such a timeless quality because the Amish dress very simply. So their clothing doesn't give away what era the picture was created in. And so these mud sales are really fun to go to because it's a way to mix with a culture very unlike your own and to capture some really interesting imagery. And here's another young boy who made eye contact with me. He noticed that I had a camera. He looked right at me. And at that moment, pop. And yes, some of these were cropped because I wanted to just, I wanted you to just concentrate on the timeless quality of the portrait and not what was in the background. Although in this case, the background was just other men wearing black jackets. So that was no problem. 
you know, now sometimes it's fun to take something that we're so used to seeing in color and just convert it to black and white to see if you can give the image a completely different kind of emotion. We have these gorgeous sunflower fields north of Baltimore and who doesn't like to visit beautiful, you know, thousand acre sunflower fields. They're, they're happy and joyful and whatever. But when I looked at this picture, I said, Lewis, I've seen this image a million times. So what can I do to it to make it different? And the first thought I had, because I was really deep into my black and white phase was, I wonder what I could make it look like if I turn this into a black and white. And so I turned it into a black and white and you can still see some of the uh, adjustments. So I'll, re I'll, I'll take the adjustments out for the moment and I'll show you what I did. So this is kind of what it looked like at first when I first did the conversion. Um, and of course in Lightroom, you still have your ability to manage your colors. And so I took the sky and I made it much deeper blue. And I wanted the flower, the main sunflower to be much more glowy. And so I increased my orange and I increased my yellow. And to play with the tonality of the foliage, there's a little tool up in this corner, that little dot right there. If you click on that dot and then bring it to a place in the image that you want to affect the tonality of, and I'll put it on this brighter portion right here. If you move your cursor up, everything in that tonality will get brighter. And if you move your cursor down, everything will get darker. And because colors are not made up of just one color, that little tool can be really helpful in um, working on certain tonality within your color files when you're converting them to black and white. So we went from here to here. And to me, this image has a completely different emotional output. It's a graphic photo of sunflower fields. It's not just a happy-go-lucky, you know, look at the pretty sunflowers. And when I entered this into one of our club competitions, it placed exactly due to that reason, because the judge said, you know, I've never seen someone do a black and white sunflower image, and I really like the way it looks. And so sometimes when you're just kind of stuck, you know, just think, well, what would this look like in, in black and white? Here's a young girl that I came across in a neighborhood very close to my house. Uh, it's a neighborhood very much in transition. And when I first came across her, she was with her brother and they were, they saw me with the camera. So they were mugging for the camera. And I took some shots of that. Um, but that's not what I really wanted, right? What I really wanted was an effective black and white um, or an effective photo. And the minute I saw her dress and her face and her hair, I knew that I could turn this into a timeless black and white image. And so again, and I'm gonna do more complicated ones soon, I'm gonna convert to black and white and right away, the image takes on that timeless quality, except for the fact that there's a plastic flower pot right here and a plastic flowering can right here, watering can, you would be really hard pressed to know when this image was taken. Even this fence doesn't have an area code on it. So it's, this fence dates back a ways and I loved the two stone raccoons. So I really loved what this did to the image. And if you noticed on the color file, she had these streaks on her face and these marks, which I didn't know 
what caused them, but I definitely wanted to leave them in. I did not know if it was from crying or from you know some other condition that she has, but I was really able to successfully turn this into um, a really timeless black and white you know image. And if I was really good at cloning, I could potentially clone out even the items that were plastic, but that would take an enormous amount of effort and time. And I decided that the image was strong enough on its own without me having to clone those things out. Now, another thing that I've been playing with, if you remember, I said I was a Fuji slide photographer. So this, I finally got my scanner to work. When I upgraded to Windows 10, my Konica Minolta scanner just, I couldn't find a driver that would make it work. And a friend of mine is a tech savvy guy, decided that he, he could figure it out and he did. And I'm now able to scan my Fuji slides into digital files. And I decided that what I wanted to see was whether the black and white versions of some of these images really would look as pop, poppy as the Fuji Velvia prints that I made from slides look. So I'm going to do a conversion to black and white. But in this case, I'm also going to click on these four boxes. And these four boxes are going to bring up the presets that exist in Lightroom. And I'm, I don't want the color presets, so I'm going to click on black and white, and that's going to eliminate the color presets. So what's my goalpost? Well, my goalpost, I want to keep that sky dark and stormy. I want to keep these white trees really bright and really make them pop. The foliage, which has a lot of green and gold in it, I want to make that pop a little more. So all you really have to do in Lightroom is just scroll through the presets. You don't even have to click on them. In Nick, you have to actually click on them, which is actually time consuming. I like this version better, just scrolling over them. And you're just looking for a better starting point. Like I'm going to pick this one. Well, that's a little too bright. I'll pick this one. So this is black and white number nine. So once you find a good preset, you can then just click close and you still have all your Lightroom tools available to you. So if I wanted to make that sky even a little darker, I could, or I could make it lighter. I kind of like it looking darker and more stormy. I could play with the oranges and the yellows and the greens, which were, which were the leaves and make those pop a little bit more. And even though these trees look pretty white, I actually want them to pop a little bit more. And so I'm gonna open up Lightroom's new toolbox. They've changed, this is where the local adjustments are, but they've changed the way the, the layout is. And by clicking that circle, you open up the toolbox. And by hitting the plus sign, you can pick one of your tools. I'm gonna to pick a brush. I'm gonna turn the mask off. And I'm just gonna add a tiny bit of exposure and a tiny bit of white. And then I'm basically gonna take my cursor, better done with a Wacom tablet, but for presentation purposes, it works fine. And the masking in Lightroom has gotten much, much better. You can see that it's not bleeding over as much into the surrounding. It is a little bit. And I'd have to go back and correct that. And then when you're done, you just click your toolbox again. And so I was successful, I thought, because when I printed a version of this, it pops just as much, if not more, as the 
print made from a Fuji Velvia slide that when I was making prints from color slides, which was actually being done in a lab. I wasn't, you know, doing that. I used to sell my work at art fairs way back in the early 2000s. So um, it's, it's definitely possible to create wonderful silver, chrome, black and white images from slides that you may have from years and years ago uh, that you probably took on either Fuji or Kodak film. Um, so it's something to keep in mind. All right, the last one we're really going to do is this one. And this is a situation that we as photographers have found ourselves in thousands of times. Being in a beautiful place, this is in Utah, on a completely horrible photography day, meaning no clouds, no atmosphere, high sky, you know, so my goal in this case was, how do I create the feeling that I felt when I was standing in front of this beautiful butte? Um, uh, I think this is near Valley of the Gods. And I decided that potentially converting it into a black and white and really changing it dramatically might help me get to that point. The first thing that I wanted to do, though, was I didn't like this rock outcropping. It really kind of disturbs the flow uh, of this mountain. And cloning, although it's better in Photoshop, it's gotten a lot better in Lightroom. So I'm going to open my cloning tool, and I'm going to make the circle big enough, the inner circle big enough, so that it takes in the whole piece that I want to clone out and I'm going to hit click and it's automatically going to pick from an area that it thinks will look the best but actually I didn't like the gray that it picked because the area that it was in was a mixture of grays and browns and so if you ever want to move your circle you just move your cursor until you see the hand appear and you just sort of have to go along the circle. But at some point, you will see a hand. Come on, where's my hand? Oh, come on, I've done this thousands of times. There it is. And I can then take the circle and move it to where I think it's going to look more realistic. And right about there is what I like. That looks much more like it looked before. And so the first thing I did was I got rid of that rock outcropping. And this looks completely natural to me. Doesn't look like I've really changed the landscape at all. And as I said, I was already thinking to get the drama back I'd have to convert to a, a black and white. So I converted to black and white. I clicked on my presets. And what's my goal post? My goal post is I want to get the sky to actually be jet black, but I don't want to lose the detail in the, the actual butte. And so I kind of started just scrolling through the presets. And I think I like this one because the sky is dark, but it, I still see a lot of detail in the mountain. So I'm going to pick black and white seven, and then I'm going to click close. And then I'm going to go down to my colors and I'm going to take the blue slider and I'm going to just turn it all the way to the left. And there's my jet black sky. And right away, I'm beginning to feel the drama that I felt. Now, there's a lot more work that needs to be done. This whole area needs to be brought out because it's too dark and too deep in shadow. There's textures down here that I want to bring out. And there's so many different ways you can do this. But you start with opening up your toolbox. Um, I could even try to use a radial gradient, um, which is an oval to a circle 
and I'm going to make it more of an oval. And then I'm going to twist it down. And I can use the center pin to move it to where I want it to be, which is right about there. And I'm going to turn the mask off. And now everything that I do is only going to happen within that gradient. And so I'm going to take the exposure up. There we go. I'm going to take the shadows way up because it was very deep in shadow. And I can see already I'm going to have to go back and fix something because there's that, that defined line there. Didn't, it didn't feather quite as well as I would have liked it to. So I'm going to take it down a little bit. And I'm going to add, I always add a little texture and I always add a little clarity. And in this case, dehaze might actually be a very effective filter as well. Now that made it a little too bright. Now, I also wanted to bring more texture and more detail down into this part. So if I click the plus sign, I can open up another tool, which will be the brush tool. And I'm gonna turn the mask off and I'm gonna add again, some exposure. And I'm gonna add, take some shadows out. I'm gonna add some white. I'm gonna reduce the blacks, which I should have done up here as well. I'm gonna add a little texture and I'm gonna add a little clarity. And then I'm basically gonna take my brush and just brush over the areas that I think need to be brought, to be brought out. And then the last part of this that I wanted to do was this cliff up here was actually a little too bright. And so I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to open up another brush, but at this time I'm going to lower the exposure. And I'm basically going to brush over that cliff so that it doesn't shine so brightly. And so we went from, you know, a scene that was really blah to a scene that even though you may disagree completely with what I did with the image, which was converted completely into something that it's not, it wasn't shot at night, but it does resurrect for me the drama that I felt as I was standing in front of this um, scene. And I, I used black and white to help me create that. So the last thing I wanted to show you was, some, some of you are gonna be familiar with what's called HDR photography, like uh, those sycamore trees were, were HDR, meaning that I took three images at three different exposure levels. and I merge them together. Well, what we're trying to do in black and white is increase our tonal range, right? Per that zone system, zero to 10. So for instance, here's an example. This was the, sh the scene that I saw. This is the scene shot at what my camera thought was the right exposure. This one is one stop under. Come on. This one is one stop over, and this is the merged HDR file. Now, as a color file, it's way too garish. It's way too over the top. It just doesn't work for me at all. But by simply converting it to black and white, I ended up with what I thought was a spectacular um, dramatic looking black and white photo. And yes, I played with the green color. You know, I made the grass a little lighter. I brightened up the fence a little bit, but it's just to show you that HDR photography is very helpful at, at, as part of black and white, as well as, as color uh, photography, especially when you're shooting with a camera that has a small sensor. 
And that these were shot with my Olympus mirrorless and Olympus, of course, I love Olympus. I've been shooting them since I've been 14. I now also do own a Nikon. Um, they have very small sensors. That's their downside is that it's a it's micro four thirds. And so it's a very small sensor and it doesn't have great dynamic range. And so thank you very much for this opportunity. I'm going to stop sharing now and the floor will be open for any other questions or, or comments that folks want to make about what we just went through. You can unmute yourself now at this point if that's what you prefer to do. Well, thank you so much, Louise, for the excellent presentation. That really puts the black and white photography in a different light. Yep. You know, so it's uh, it, um, it was yep. really good. I admire your your pictures, uh, especially I like the pictures that you took at the the Amish uh, mud. Yep. Uh, yeah. I don't know what mud, yep. mud sale. At the mud sales. Yep, they're but, great yeah. places. Yeah, they're great places to go get pictures of a different culture that we're not familiar with. Yeah. Um, um, I have a question for you, yes. Lou, Pamela Peters here. Um, I, I think you dis disclose it a little bit because you like the fog so much. Yes. But do you have a favorite time of the day? A well, favorite time of the day. My favorite time of day is too early in the morning because I don't get up that early anymore. And so therefore my second favorite time of day is late in the day. Okay. Like, you know, after this time of year, after 4.30 in the afternoon. Now that all changes if it's a cloudy day, because if it's a cloudy day, you can go out all day and shoot. But, you know, when you go on a workshop, they purposely have you out early in the morning they come back at like 9, 30, 10 o'clock and everybody has breakfast. Then they do their Photoshop and Lightroom stuff. And then they take you back out again late in the day because the worst time of day to shoot is when that when I got that color shot of that butte in, in Utah because you could see how blah it was. It was, you know, I had nothing to work with. I had no clouds in the sky. It was high sky. That's the worst time to shoot. And so, you know, sunny days are not our friends as photographers. Cloudy, foggy, misty, overcast, stormy days are the days when you're gonna come back from a little outing with your best imagery, whether it be black and white or color. Yeah, thank you very much. Sure. Thank you very much for an excellent presentation. I went to high school in Baltimore. Oh, great. And was a member of the high school photography club. Our <laughs> teacher was a Greek who taught um, Latin and French in high school. And he uh, really did not know much about photography. I'm sorry you were not the coach of our <laughs> photography club uh, back in the 1950s. I do have a question. Uh, your chart of emotions. Yes. Uh, what is the origin of that and how can we get a copy of that? Just Google search colors and emotions and you'll come up with thousands of examples. I just picked that one because it looked best as a part of a presentation because the, the blocks of color were so big, but I found at least a hundred different charts that displayed that. Um, and as I said, it was very eye-opening to me because I, I, as I said, we're not taught, it's not like we were taught in elementary school that when you see blue, you should think calm, or when you see green, you should think nurture or nature. That's just how we, in the Western culture, have, you know, are brought up. It's just innate almost. So it, just do a Google search and you'll find tons of examples. Thank you. Excellent, pre excellent presentation. I'm glad everybody enjoyed it. I hope our photographic paths will cross again in the future.
Lewis, I wanted to thank you too for taking the time to show us your process for post-processing the photos too, not just showing us the photos. So I, I found that helpful. And I was actually processing one of my landscape photos while you were talking and uh, picked good. up some tips from you. So thank you. Very good. Well, again, thanks guys. I really appreciate the opportunity. I, I, I have a question. Yes. Uh, what was interest to me is when you showed that setup of how different colors come out in grayscale. Yeah. I yeah. had never thought about that at all. Yeah. Yep. And, uh, do you have that in your mind as much so that you can, when you see a color picture, you can kind of guess how it's going to come out? Kind of. But, it, but you're, the best word you used just now was guess, because you really yeah. don't ever 100% know. And I could have yeah. taken either of those examples and with the color channels i could have made those much more contrasty so i don't want you to think that just because the luminosity values of certain colors are similar that you can't turn it into a good black and white if, if the bones are there for a good photograph yeah. then you can take it into the digital dark room and just punch up certain <laughs> colors and give it the contrast that it needs I just felt it was. But Ansel, but Ansel Adams wouldn't have been able to do that. No, no, he did not have that in his head. <laughs> so wonderful presentation. Thank you. Thank you. I really, op I thank you again for the opportunity of being able to talk to your club. It was very much appreciated. And before you jump off, I just want to, because as soon as you go off, others might join it as well. I just wanted to remind them that we're going to do just a, a quick meeting after um, Lewis is, is finished just to go over some club business and talk about our next meeting. Okay. So okay. I don't want everybody to jump off. <laughs> okay. I'll see you. I'll, hopefully our paths will cross again in the future. I have another presentation. I'll let Laszlo know about it. It's all about perception and perspective. And so maybe that's one you could put on your calendar later on this year or maybe next year. Thank All right, sounds good. Much. Thank you. Okay, thank, thank you, you so much. Thank Everybody you, Luis. Be well and have a great rest of year. Okay. All right, thank you. Thanks a lot. All okay, right. so I didn't, we have quite a few people here. I, I'm not gonna take too much of your time. Um, Down just, I, just I do one think... second. Down just yes. one second. Yeah. I just wanna, um, uh putting something we got a guest uh um uh, member over here well guest attendee and his name is stefan segmiller and uh he's from cornwall and he's a guy good to know because he is opening up a gallery in cornwall so may some someone to keep in mind maybe in the future we just uh want to talk him into displaying our pictures in there. Plus, he has got uh, uh, some really nice size uh, printer, you know, that uh, in case someone is interested in printing, I don't know if he's uh, uh, really eager to do it or not, but maybe we can talk him into it. So <laughs> that's... Okay. Uh, well, welcome, Stephen. Yeah. I don't know if he's here right now or not, but uh, he's muted. Yeah, I know the so. video's not on, so I'm not sure. Yeah. yeah. All, All right, right. I so didn't have a. Okay, I didn't have a lot of things to go over. Um, one, I just wanted to remind people that the um, NE Triple C voting has begun. Um, I wanted to mention that uh, one picture came in a little late uh, due to my error that it, the picture was sent to me instead of Laszlo and I missed it in my email. So um, I've given it to Laszlo and he's going to post it. And I would ask that anybody who's already voted and there's been three, three people that voted besides myself, um, if you could go in there and um, vote on that image that, that you would have missed, um, that would be appreciated. Um, it's going to be in the pictorial category. So I just wanted to mention that. Um, secondly, the newsletter, I wanted to thank Laszlo for all your hard work every month on the newsletter. It's, it's much appreciated. Um, we have a couple of members who routinely send articles. Um, a lot of people send pictures for the topic. Um, 
if you can do an article, that would be nice. I'm working on one myself to send in to Laszlo this month, but you know, it doesn't have to be long. It could just be your favorite spot, the photograph and, or, you know, an interesting place to photograph where you just want to give a, you know, one paragraph for other members to, to be able to know of that location and whatnot, but it doesn't have to be a very a long article. I'm not sure. George, George, can you go on mute? Thank you. Um, but anyway, just uh, help out and also, you know, share what you can with the other club members. Um, I like to see uh, the um, articles and see other places to photograph that I might not have known about and whatnot. So, uh, or styles of photo uh, photography, um, and it could be a number of topics. Um, so just just try to do that to help Laszlo out. I. I did the newsletter for several years and I know it's difficult if you're not getting content. Um, I wanted to mention that uh, it looks like we're going to do the share and fair again. So that was quite successful last year. Um, Heidi and Jeff kind of um, coordinated that last year. I'm hoping they do that this year. <laughs> Heidi. <laughs> no um, but we so people can put it on their calendars. It's going to be Saturday, August 6th from I think it's from 10 to 5. So mark your calendar. Sharon Craft Show on the Green, Saturday, August 6th. Okay. And we'll we'll start sending uh reminders out for it, you know, as we get closer and um, Heidi and I and uh, some of the um, committee members will get together and just do some coordination ahead of time and talk about, you know, how many photos per member we want to submit and how we want to uh, coordinate the setup and the takedown, etc. And I remember last year, Heidi did a um, kind of a retrospective and had some good notes that she took to um, help us to make improvements in some areas where we need to um, to make it flow a little bit better this year. So we'll get Actually, better at it each year. Yeah, and um, we were asking for feedback before. I don't think we got a lot, but if anybody on this call wants to provide feedback on last year's craft show, just send me an email. It can be anonymous. It's okay, I won't memorize who sent me what. I'm just looking for some you know, real good constructive ideas on what we can do to make it better. Last year was our first one and we've got no place to go but up in my mind. Not that it was bad, it was good, but it can always be- It was bad. actually good. We got a, a couple of speakers out of it and a couple of new members out of it. So yeah, I think it was successful overall. It was good exposure, yes. um, but definitely looking for ways to make it better from everyone's perspective. Yes, yes. All right, and then I wanted to talk about our next meeting, which is going to be um, April 19th. We are trying to do a face-to-face -face meeting. Um, it will be only our second one this season. The only other one was the uh, holiday party. Um, it looks like we're going to be able to go back to Noble Horizons for the meeting, which is kind of good news. Um, I'm waiting for just the, the final okay on that. They were going to have a meeting, um, I forget if it was yesterday or today, to talk about um, what the new guidelines are for allowing um, outside uh, clubs and organizations to come in um, into their location. So I need to find out if you know, masks are required or vaccinations or, or what they're gonna require. And then we'll put that out to the team and uh, make a decision as to whether that's where we're going to meet or if we're gonna go back to the church, um, which is where we had the Christmas party. Um, for the topic, we actually didn't have a scheduled speaker. We were thinking since it's the first time we're actually uh, getting together um, in a meeting that we would kind of keep it open. And some of the things that uh, Jeff was very nice to put together a list, he was thinking, you know, obviously cover any club business and discuss our, our way forward. We, we want to talk about, you know, what, what um, positions are open in the club and maybe get back to a little more formal organization. Um, it's been a little loosey goosey and um, try to fill some of the positions that aren't filled. So we'll talk about what positions are open and what you need to do in those positions and then see if we can't fill some of those 
Um, we've had our uh, help wanted notice in our newsletter for almost two years now, <laughs> so we'd like to fill some of those. Um, we also wanted to um, have people bring in their equipment. We have a number of, uh, especially some new members that have some equipment that they want uh, help with. And we thought it would be a good time if we're meeting face to face where you could bring in your camera, bring in your equipment and you know ask questions about how to use it and settings and whatnot. And we could break off into individual groups um, to do a discussion and, and just kind of have a, a an open free form meeting and uh we'll have um obviously coffee and snacks and whatnot but just just keep it light and just try to plan how we want to um what we want to do going forward with the club i would like to uh, talk about maybe some field trips that we could go on and uh hopefully we get some nice weather and it sticks with us and we can start to do that again um and anything else that the uh, club wants to discuss so that's the plan for the next meeting. And the only thing up in the air really is just the location, which we'll send out when we when we know. And what's the date, Don? The date for that? That was uh, April 19th. April 19th, Tuesday, 7 p.m. So like I said, I'll, I'll let you know as soon as I do. Uh, if we're going to go back to Noble or not, I'm waiting for um, an email from my contact there. And I think that's it. Uh, is anybody that's on the call, do you have anything you want to bring up or mention? Yeah, Steve is finally in there. So hi, Steve. Hi, Steve, how are you? Stefan, hi. Stefan, sorry. It's yeah. Stefan, yeah. Stefan. Yeah, that's nice okay. Laszlo. I, I was here, I just, uh, wasn't able to unmute in time. Okay, great. So Stefan is the one with the studio and you can see it behind him. And it's a very nice place. So um, whenever he will have a show, I will let you guys know and then you can come and visit him. Nice that to reminds me too. Is your uh -huh. email in the list, Laszlo, Stefan's email? I'm sorry. Is Stefan's email in the last email that you sent out? No, no. I just uh, I just uh, got in touch with Stefan today. Oh, okay. So, uh, uh, my email is uh, just add Gmail to my name, and and you can reach me there. Yeah, uh, I will send okay. out his email address to to the members, and uh, Stefan. Um, might be able to give us a presentation as well uh, about his work and you know his uh, you know gallery and so on so we can keep him in mind for the uh, next season okay so that's another thing I did think of two two more two more things. Um, one is I did reach out to Noble and ask them about doing a show. We typically do a show in January. Obviously, that's past um, because they haven't been able to have any clubs and organizations in. They may not have a full schedule for shows, so they might be able to fit us in on another month. So um, I've reached out to, like I said, my contact, and I'm waiting to hear back regarding that as well, because it's been a while since we've actually had a, um, a show anywhere. And there was one more thing. What was the other thing? Um, oh, June. For the June meeting, it's our final meeting of the season, and... I kind of wanted to do something like we did last year where we did something outdoors and last year we went to Kent and people brought snacks and food and whatnot, but uh, kind of wanted to run it by the club to see if you guys had any preference on how we did the meeting or where we did the meeting, if you have any ideas of where we could do it outdoors. Okay, so I, I got some good if ideas. If you don't think of them I, now, you can send, send yeah. some ideas and then we can discuss it. I haven't so. been to that industry garden. I saw that was one of your past meeting points. 
in Millbrook? Yes. Mid yeah, Innis Innisfree is, is nice. The um, only thing is the, uh, I'm not sure what their hours are. Uh, they definitely wouldn't be open in the evenings, so we could go there as a field trip, and we've done that before. It is very nice, but uh, we, I, we probably wouldn't be able to have the meeting there, and there is a fee to get into that place. It's, it's not very, very much, but there is a fee to get in, but I know that um, I, I'm pretty sure that they close pretty early, so I'm not sure, but I'll double check the hours on that. Yeah, but that's a possible field trip to go to. We've gone there many times. It's it's very nice. Especially this time of year, actually. They have um, one huge, one one big hillside, which is all filled with um, daffodils. It's very pretty. So this is a good time of year to go there. Oh, is that the daffodil place? It, it's called, I, I can't remember what it's called. Is it actually in, it's in New York State, right? This is the same place that has all the daffodils? I don't think so. I think that, I mean, it's just a, um, it's like an oriental garden, but they do have one hillside that has all the daffodils, but um, it has different sections to it. And uh, it's in Millbrook. So if you, oh. if you Google Innisfree as one word, I-N-N-I-S-F-R-E-E. -E. Okay. Then I know a different daffodil place and Laszlo remind me, I'll send it to okay. you for an article. Okay. Sounds good. Okay. okay. All right, anybody got anything else? Well, I, I think these Zoom meetings have been extraordinarily good. And thank you, Laszlo, for co coordinating them. Well, you're welcome. I'm having fun with that, especially when they work. No, th th this one worked well. Yes. Okay, good to hear that. All right. All right, I think that's it then. I'll let everybody go. It's about quarter to nine, so you're probably ready so to, how do ready we know to about go. This, how do we know about the assignment? Because I always see the day before our meeting, oh, we had an I assignment, and I figured. Uh, well, it's in, it's in the previous newsletter to start with, you know, which, uh, you know, probably I'm hiding it quite well, but I will send it to you. Well, well, I just well, went through that newsletter three times and I could not find it. And I thought, well, maybe you put it in the in the text of the email. Maybe that's where it was. I couldn't find it in the newsletter. So I don't know what the topic is. He makes it what, so you have to read the whole thing in order to find it. The, I did though three times and I couldn't find it. No, no. What's the next assignment? That you're supposed to be happy when you find it, you know? So What's the next assignment? Let us know. <laughs> He's going to make you go back to the newsletter. Look it up. It's, well, we, yeah. isn't it, isn't it critters? You. Is it critters? Oh, yes, that's what it is. Critters. Right. Yeah, yes. that's right. Now I, that you said that. I read it as well. <laughs> yeah. I read your newsletter. I did read it. <laughs> I wanted to mention it on this call, but I could not find it. I went through several times. So it was hidden. <laughs> that should be an easy enough one to do. Yeah. But yeah. All right. I think that's it then. Thank you, everyone, for attending. Appreciate it. Thank you, and, everyone. Uh, we'll send Bye. news out about the next meeting when we have it. Thank you, everyone. Everybody. Bye. Bye. Yeah, Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye